Welcome to module 16 of object oriented analysis and design. We have uh, so far been taking different analytical looks into complex systems, their attributes and variety of commonalities and approaches that could be adopted to analyze these complex systems from various aspects of objects and classes and their relationships. In specific, we have uh, looked at uh, different elements of uh, major and minor elements of objects. We have looked at the nature of objects and that of classes. We have looked at their relationships in depth. From this point onward, we are slowly taking the course towards uh, practicing all the different principles that we have already discussed. So, from this module onwards, where we will talk about some of the major tools and techniques of actually identifying objects and classes from a given specification of written verbal interactive or pictorial kind and start taking example an active exercise example with our leaf management system and some of the other systems to illustrate how as a practitioner you would actually engage in the object oriented analysis and design processes. So, this module is to understand the importance and difficulties of classification. We have uh, seen in the earlier discussion in theory that uh, whatever way we look at the system, it is very critical to identify objects, identify classes. So, given the whole bunch of concepts and dynamics of the system, it is a critical requirement to classify them according to certain commonalities, which we can capture in terms of the classes. And there have been lot of work uh, on this in terms of classical approaches and then they were followed by several modern approaches. We will not go into that historical uh, development. We would rather focus very specifically into how we can adopt these and apply them in practice. This will be the gross outline of the module and uh, we will uh, continue to display this on the left hand side of every screen. So, first uh, let me briefly talk about what is classification. Uh, of course, uh, um, uh, most of you would know that uh, classification is a process whereby we put some kind of an order in other knowledge, some kind of uh, a boundary around things that are similar, tasks that are similar or actions that are similar or they share something. So, here in this uh, um, uh, illustrative uh, diagram, I am trying to show that uh, we often uh, when we these days uh, go to dispose uh, garbage, then we have we get a number of different vats, some written with uh, glass, some written with plastic and uh, so on. And depending on what we have, whether uh, we have a vegetable waste, a biological waste or we have a plastic cup and depending on that, we need to decide which vat we should put our garbage into. So, this process that we are doing mentally is actually a process of classification. And uh, in general, we will need to do this for given the system that we would like to uh, analyze. So, classification will help to identify generalization, specialization and aggregation amongst the hierarchies amongst the classes. It will also help in making the decisions about modularization that is what all items, what all classes, what all processes we should put together. In, in terms of coupling and cohesion, the two main quality metrics that we have studied in the earlier module indicating the sameness is also decided primarily by the classification and it plays a critical role in terms of allocating processes to different processors. So, having said that, uh, let us uh, recognize that the classification is not an easy problem, because given the same scenario, 
multiple observers could classify them in multiple different ways, because it is not there cannot be any very straightforward or uh, mathematical or algorithmic way to classify given a scenario, because it, it pretty much depends on the experience of the observer, it depends on the domain, it depends on what uh, you and I identify as the most discriminating parameter in the classification process. So, it is a it is quite a difficult uh, process to go with. So, just to illustrate uh, with a little bit uh, more concrete example, let us take uh, this uh, example from uh, uh, Butch's uh, OAD book, where we are trying to create, we are given uh, pictures of uh, 10 different trains. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 different trains. And uh, these trains uh, have an engine and a couple of compartments that it drags. And we would like to create meaningful groups, meaningful classification of these trains. So, we can divide them, classify them according to, if you just do not have a guideline, if you just look into this uh, picture and you will be able to uh, create different kind of uh, classification depending on for example, the presence and absence of a particular property. You could decide that okay, I will look for certain common properties. This is this is pretty much like the you know uh, the IQ test uh, stuff that uh, we keep on doing all the time. For example, we can observe that uh, different planes trains have different kind of colored wheels. Some have black, some have white some have white and we can decide a classification based on the color of the wheel. So, we will have trains which have black wheels, white wheels and which have black and white wheels both. So, if we look at that then this is completely black wheel, but uh, this is completely white wheel, this is completely white wheel whereas, this one is black and white wheel. So, we can classify the trains according to this. Alternately, we could say no it is that is not the right way to classify, I would really need to understand how long the train is. So, I will classify it based on the property of the length of the train. So, if you look at that then uh, they will fall in three groups where uh, trains with which have two bogies, three bogies and four bogies like this has two bogies, this has two bogies whereas, uh, this train has three bogies, this train has four bogies and so on. Accordingly, we can classify into different uh, groups, they will get three classes for that. And in this way, if you try to look at all these different patterns that exist in this image, uh, then as it turns out that there are 93 different classifications that are possible. And in real life, unfortunately, and that is where the major challenge of the practitioner uh, lies, is there is no exactly right answer, that this is, this is right and this is uh, absolutely true, there is nothing like that. So, we will have to work within this level of uncertainty and ambiguity that exists in classification. So, based on this, uh, the identification of classes have been tried in various different ways, and as of the current practice, it uh, primarily relies on one on clustering, and then next is on identification. The clustering is the process by which that uh, you say that uh, given all the different uh, concepts uh, that we have in the domain, how can we group them together, how can we classify and make groups, every group that you make by classification we say is a cluster. And the other is once we have created clusters, then we identify what is the characteristics of that cluster. So, that is a two basic process and once we have been able to identify the characteristics, we say that these are the key abstractions. And as we had mentioned several times before, three abstractions become classes in your system. So, in terms of clustering, there are uh, uh, three main approaches, which we will slowly illustrate in the next couple of slides. We start with the structural clustering. In structural clustering, the objects are divided into disjoint sets depending on the presence or absence of a particular property, pretty much the way we were addressing this earlier. So, if we look at the color of the wheels, then we get uh, three groups that could be one structural clustering. 
we will again get three groups if we look into the number of uh, bogies that uh, every train has and so on. So, we are using different properties like color of the wheel or the number of bogies and to cluster the given uh, set of possible objects into different cluster groups and this process since it is based on certain concrete properties is known as structural clustering. So, in many situations a structural clustering it is relatively easy to do clust structural clustering because once you can uh, zero in on some property then you can apply it or apply the property with its all possible values and they lead to the different clusters that will emerge from the system. The next is uh, often okay, uh, I can change the game uh, as is the reality in most cases that uh, it is not only one or two structural parameters that define the way objects will work, the way objects will interact. So, let us uh, look at some of the conceptual properties. It is like uh, let us say we can you can see in this uh, diagram uh, in this uh, picture that uh, the bogies have different kinds of symbol like this has a circle symbol, uh, this uh, has a rectangle symbol, this has a triangle symbol, this has another circle symbol and so on. So, let us uh, uh, suppose we know that these symbols characterize the type of content that the bogey transports. So, let us say just hypothetically the circles uh, represent toxic chemicals, let us say rectangles represent timber logs the big wooden logs and maybe all other uh, shapes represent passengers. So, if we say that this is our basis of classification that we will uh, classify based on these uh, concepts then let us see what where does it take us. So, we can classify the trains according to for example, whether or not they carry toxic goods. We can classify the trains based on whether they are passenger trains or goods train that is whether they just carry passenger or they just carry goods. Again if we do based on this then we can sub classify that is it a passenger train which carries toxic goods or is it a goods train which carries toxic goods. So, as we get more and more knowledge now if you if you just look at the picture if you just look at the diagram then the kind of structural clustering that we had been doing is the first attempt that you can make because it is immediately visible. But here what I have done along with that picture I have given you more information from the domain that circles mean toxic item the squares mean lumbers and others mean uh, passengers and so on. So, using that you can look at the objects in a more conceptual framework and perform a better classification in as we have been highlighting. So, this process as executed is known as the conceptual clustering process and it is uh, subversive to the structural clustering process. A third approach which uh, at times is taken is uh, where you will find that abstractions neither have a clear bounded properties nor a very well defined concept. In the earlier two we had either had clear bounded properties like uh, color of the wheel, like number of bogies or concepts like toxicity like being a passenger train or a goods train. But in some domains in many times we will see that the abstractions do not offer that. For example, if you talk about game now there is no common property which is shared by all the games that we have or that we practice. But the interesting thing is that uh, Usually, if we if we say that this is we are talking about uh, Chinese checker, we are talking about chess, we are talking about soccer, we are talking about uh, wrestling, we all would be able to identify that uh, it is a game. So, the the classification in terms of uh, games and in terms of varieties of games is not easy using the bounded properties or concepts. So, it needs to be identified by what uh, is commonly known as family of resemblance that what you do is a, is a is a simple approach you identify you suppose that a class of objects 
is represented by a prototype. You say, okay, this is the prototype that I have. So, I have a prototype which is a chessboard, let us say. And then we consider, so let us say the all the all the um, classes, possible classes that we have, they have prototypes. So, given a particular game, we would like to see what is the prototype that resembles the given one most closely. So, let us say for uh, if we have classes like uh, um, represented by chess, represented by soccer, represented by say wrestling, represented by swimming, suppose these are the representative ones. Then if you are given say Chinese checker, what you will try to do, you will try to analyze that what it is most similar to of these different prototypes. And of course, if you analyze that, it is expected that you will come to the conclusion that the Chinese checker is most similar to chess and we will classify that along with chess. And then you will try to look for some common property that uh, may have been shared between them. For example, you could come up then with the identification that okay, you classified it this way because both of them are board games. But uh, suppose if you are uh, given a, a, a different, uh, um, uh, different game, say if you are uh, given uh, say let us take kabadi. So, if you are given kabadi and you try to again similarly try to do this measures, then certainly you will not find it similar to chess, you will not find it similar to uh, swimming, possibly you will find it most similar to wrestling and you will classify kabadi to be in the same cluster as of wrestling. So, going by this kind of a prototype based approach is known as the prototype theory, which is very common in uh, identification of abstractions in classification of abstractions, particularly when the structural and the conceptual clustering approaches do not produce any meaningful results. Now, once you have been able to perform the cluster, then you need to you will get a whole lot of. So, in the in the system now you have uh, various different uh, clusters that have been formed, maybe too many of them. Now, your next process is some kind of a filtering that you need to do is if you say that everything that you could you, I could cluster into uh, segregable identifiable items. If I say that every one of them is a class and it should have its own relationships and uh, identification and all that, it might become you might uh, have too much of uh, incoherent set of uh, system design. So, then you try to be more go into more refinement and uh, primarily try to uh, decide on key abstractions. That is out of these clusters, out of these uh, classes that we have created, what are the key ones that are important. And that is a very subjective uh, decision. Primarily, the approach that uh, OAD takes is key abstractions uh, try to follow the vocabulary of the problem domain. That is, what is the predominant vocabulary the problem domain is using, and what is the boundary of this problem. It also has to highlight the things that exist in the system, and in this process, the whole identification of key abstraction is extremely domain specific. So, again it is it's, it's a difficult process, but uh, if you focus on some of the typical characteristics of uh, the system that you are discussing, what are the abstractions that is class classifications as identified by you, what are the abstractions that are more often talked about, what are the abstractions that are more often active or take part in critical activities, what are the ones which fall within a certain boundary of the system and so on. If you focus on those, it will become usually easy to identify the key abstractions. Now, at this point you should also note that uh, identification actually involves uh, two processes. One we say is discovery, other we say is the invention. Now, the basic difference between the discovery and the invention is, if you look into the whole requirement of OAD, then 
we have two sides of this whole one is the user and one is the developer right that is that is a basic thing that we are trying to do right. The user has a is with a system user needs certain uh, functionalities to be built on the problem domain that the user uses and you are the developer we are the developer who is are trying to do this. So, the user has certain view of the system. So, if you ask the user as to what the Cree abstractions are user certainly talks about the vocabulary of the problem domain in pure form. So, if you if the um, user is, uh, is using an automated teller then the user will talk about accounts it automated teller means uh, the typical ATM machines or the bank counters where you can withdraw cash. So, that kind of a user will talk about uh, accounts, deposits, withdrawals. So, these are the words which will form the vocabulary of the user and therefore, will become key abstractions in your system. And analyzing to find these key abstractions is the process of discovery. But once you come to the developer side who will implement the system, the developer will need to often deal with in addition to the key abstractions identified, the developer will also need to deal with various different abstractions like database, like screen managers, like lists, queues and so on so forth. Because the implementation will happen in the domain of the developer which has a different set of vocabulary and identifying these key abstractions is a process of invention. And naturally what uh, the actual design process involve is how do you map these Cree abstractions into these different key abstractions that the developer will need to deal with that is basically mapping the problem into the implementation and that is the role of the process of uh, identification of key abstraction and as ever it is a highly domain dependent and quite a complex process and we will need to go through that more. So, to be able to apply these uh, techniques and please uh, be reminded uh, what I said at the beginning of this module this now we are trying to to talk about techniques which more than theory will have to be practiced by us from the next module onwards. We will start applying this on an on an exercise and try to see how things go. So, what is most important is uh, as you uh, recapitulate on the approaches that we have talked of please uh, realize that the if you are given the problem for identification of objects and classes that the first thing to do then first what you should try is to the first you should try to go with the properties relevant to a particular problem domain, which means that the first approach that you are taking. So, you try to learn what are the properties that exist in that uh, particular domain, what is the typical vocabulary and all that and try to do a clustering based on those properties. So, you are trying to follow a structural clustering and identifying the class structures and behaviors that exist in the system. With this you will be able to make some progress, some of the concepts abstractions will get identified, but it is likely that uh, this will not solve the whole of the problem. So, it will fail at a certain point, it will not give you a satisfactory class structure possibly and if it does not succeed then you go to the clustering objects by concept, then you try to identify that from amongst the vocabulary again that what are not primarily properties, but more like uh, concepts uh, from the domain and let us try to apply those concepts and that will give rise to the behavior of collaborating objects, because concepts often are not uh, just like prop I mean if, if they are concrete uh, very concrete and with respect to only one object or one type of class then they will be more like properties. But concepts are more across different uh, objects across different classes. So, they will show up more as collaborating objects behavior of collaborating objects and that is what you should try to discover from the conceptual clustering which is your second step. 
if few things are still unresolved, if do both these approaches have not been able to completely solve your problem, then you try to approach classification by association, which is the basic uh, approach of uh, going by prototype that you try to see okay, this is uh, I know this is a chess and I have a uh, Chinese checker and let me see how that associates with a chess, a soccer, a wrestling or a swimming and based on that association, I will classify the concept and I will get a proto, I mean using that prototypical object, I will get a classification of the concept. And by this uh, hopefully, you have been able to classify by these three, you have been able to complete your classification process and you have identified all the classes. Uh, that you could do at this stage. So, once this is done, then you should engage in identifying the key abstraction that is you go deeper in the problem domain again, you look into the vocabulary more closely and amongst all the different uh, possible you know, candidate classes that uh, you have got, you try to identify which are the key abstractions, which are the most important one, the most engaging ones and try to pick them out and then look for more of their relationships to go forward. So, this is the broad uh, starting approach and again uh, please uh, recall that uh, what I have been uh, saying very repeatedly is that uh, the whole process of object oriented analysis and design is a iterative refinement process. So, you start somewhere, um, apply some of the methods, make a hypothesis, make a design based on that design you try to check uh, how are you doing in terms of the quality of that uh, design and then you try to refine the design. You try to use some more knowledge, so to extract some more knowledge if required you go back to the customer and talk to the customer again, try to get more information, uh, possibly go to the domain uh, documentation, domain knowledge expert, get more information about the domain and again refine the design that you have done again maybe go over the whole of uh, structural, conceptual, clustering and prototype uh, being and re-identification or refinement of key abstractions, uh, discovering more of associations and then you come back and do the measure again. So, this repetitive process is very critical in terms of doing this design. So, in this module we have understood and identify uh, and uh, tried to understand the identification of classes and objects and uh, we uh, have observed that there is no right answer to this question, there is no absolutely proper way to identify and organize classes and uh, in many a cases one between two competing designs, one may be better in certain aspects and one may be better in certain other aspects, there may not be a clear winner, but certainly there are various aspects, various measures and representations which will with which we will be able to say that this is a more proper design than the another one. So, based on this uh, our uh, next uh, task uh, as we go into uh, the module 17 onwards, we would now try to uh, with these uh, tools at our hand, we will try to we will take up the leaf management system exercise and we will try to apply them and see actually on the ground how we can do this clustering, how we can identify the key abstraction, relationships, associations and slowly start building up the design.